Gunslingers, duels, sheriffs, cowboys, outlaws, and lots of action brings us to talk about the Wild West. While the American frontier may not have always been like the movies, some individuals from the Wild West are very interesting. So today, here at Unexplained Mysteries, we'll be taking a look at three old Wild West individuals and their stories. Olive Oatman In 1851, a Native American-led massacre of a Mormon family in the Sonoran Desert left a curious scene. Where there should have been nine bodies to represent each member of the attacked family, there were only six. What follows for the three survivors, most famously Olive Oatman, is shrouded in myth and intrigue. The Oatman family consisted of Royce and Mary Ann Oatman and their seven children, whom they were raising Mormon. After the family left the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, they joined the Brewsterites, followers of James C. Brewster. In 1851, they embarked on a journey to California, told that the Golden State was the true home for Mormons, not Utah. They were originally a part of a 90-person group that had left from Independence, Missouri. The group split up, however, in New Mexico, with Royce ultimately leading one of the groups on a route through Tucson. After they arrived in Maricopa County, Arizona, they learned that the trail ahead was not safe due to native tribes with a history of brutality against white travelers. While most of the group decided to stay and rest in Maricopa Wells, recovering from heat exhaustion, Royce led his family forward, fearing that otherwise his stock would not make the journey. Unfortunately, everything the family was warned of came true. On the banks of the Gila River, which is about 90 miles from Yuma, a tribe of Native Americans, most likely the Yavape, approached them and asked for food and other resources. Eventually, this exchange turned into an attack that left five of the Oatmans losing their life. One survivor was 15-year-old Lorenzo, who was left to die, having been unconscious. Two of his sisters, Olive, 14 years old, and Mary Ann, 7 years old, were nowhere to be found. Lorenzo stumbled across a settlement where his wounds were tended. He rejoined the group of Mormon emigrants he had split from in New Mexico. With this group, he returned to the scene and discovered the six bodies. Tragically, they could not give the Oatmans a proper burial due to the rough volcanic soil. Instead, stones were built around their bodies. It has been rumoured that Arizona pioneer Charles Poston ultimately moved their remains to the river. Meanwhile, Olive and Mary Ann were taken by the Yavape to their village, 60 miles away. The long walk through the desert left the girls severely dehydrated, but their arrival at the village offered them no solace. It was there that they were treated as slaves, forced to forage for food and other resources. The sisters lived in constant fear of losing their lives, as they were perpetually ill-treated and burned with hot sticks. This ordeal lasted two years until a group of Mojave tribe members traded horses, blankets, and various other goods for the girls. The sisters had to trek to the desert once more, now to the Mojave village near Needles, California. In this village, life started to look up. They were located in a peaceful valley along the Colorado River. Espanase, a tribe leader, adopted them. The sisters grew close to his wife and his daughter. The family allowed them to live as they pleased, they were allocated land to grow their own crops. They were also inducted into the community through the tattooing of lines on their chins and arms with blue cactus ink. This ritual is believed to ensure a positive afterlife. The sisters eventually took on their clan's name, Och. They were so assimilated that Olive began to forget English. A few years later, 200 white railroad surveyors visited the village to do some trading. Olive and Mary Ann did not take the opportunity to ask for help or even tell any of the men they were kidnapped. Historians are uncertain if this is due to their quality of life with the Mojaves or because they did not know they had a living relative, Lorenzo. Despite their alleged happiness with the tribe, things soon turned for the worse. A severe drought and subsequent crop shortage led to the sister Mary Ann dying along with many other tribe members. Olive survived, but only because her adoptive mother was feeding her in secret. 
In 1855, Francisco, a man from the Quechen tribe, arrived at the village as a messenger from the US federal government. In Fort Yuma, where Olive's brother was living in desperate search, authorities had picked up on word that a young white woman was residing with the Mojaves, and they wanted an explanation. The Mojaves hid Olive and dodged questions. When that strategy did not work, they tried to convince Francisco that she was not white. This put the tribe in a difficult situation. While they were very fond of Olive, the government threatened to destroy the tribe. It was ultimately Olive who revealed the truth, leading to the enragement of the tribe, who then discussed killing her for her punishment. Her foster family stepped in and facilitated a final deal. Olive could return to the US government in exchange for a horse and other goods. Topeka, her adoptive sister, joined her on the trip as a mediator. Olive cried on her return to the fort. She was made to dress in western-style dress and wash her painted face and dyed hair. Her reunion with her brother not long after her return made headlines across the country. Several details about these events still remain unclear. Royal Stratton, a Methodist minister, wrote Captivity of the Oatman Girls in 1857 after interviewing Olive. The book claims that Olive never had any relationships with any tribe members. However, her childhood best friend Susan Thompson, who she had reunited with, claimed that she married a Mojave man and had two sons, which account for her grief upon returning to her old society. In the lectures she gave after the book's release, she claimed to have been tattooed as an identifying marker, while historians mentioned that all Mojave women have the same tattoo. Olive also claimed that she was taken by the Apache, not the Yavapai tribe, which historians think to be untrue as well. Her perspective on Native Americans was frequently contradicting. She called them savages publicly, but privately longed to go back to the tribe. She also reminisced with Mojave tribe members later in life. The royalties from the book paid for Olive and Lorenzo to go to college. In 1865, Olive married banker John B. Fairchild in New York. They settled in Texas and adopted a baby girl named Mammy. Olive battled depression for the rest of her life. Olive Oatman died in 1903 at the age of 65 after having a heart attack. Letters found after her passing describe her poor mental state. She mourned the grief of losing her first family and the loss of her second family. It is unclear whether or not Olive suffered from Stockholm Syndrome. Olive Oatman still has a legacy today. The Arizona ghost town Oatman is also named after her. The Blue Tattoo, The Life of Olive Oatman is a 2009 schoolery biography that debunks her life. It seems that Olive Oatman lived multiple lives, lives that were constantly taken away from her, while new ones were being built. Oatman's experience of constant loss and change is a tragic depiction of being caught between two worlds. Texas Jack Vermillion Texas Jack Vermillion had a knack for creating a reputation. Originally John Wilson Vermillion, he earned himself other names over his lifetime, such as Texas Jack. Texas Jack was born in 1842 in Russell County, Virginia, the second of 12 children. His parents were William Vermillion and Nancy Owens. He joined the Confederate Army during 1861. In 1865, after the Civil War had ended, he married Margaret Horton in Sullivan County, Tennessee. After that, the couple moved to the city where Jack worked as a marshal. Jack and Margaret had one daughter and a younger son. A few weeks after the son's birth, however, a diphtheria outbreak caused Margaret and both children to die when Jack was out of town. After this tragedy, Jack moved to Dodge City, Kansas. In his grief, he gambled and drank heavily and was known as an apathetic gunslinger. After Dodge City burned, he was hired by City Marshal Virgil Earp to protect the land. But Jack ended up in Montana and was severely injured in a saloon fight, where he was rescued by gunfighter Doc Holliday. Jack never got out of trouble, however. Eventually, he became a wanted man after taking the life of a man who accused him of cheating at cards. He continued to work as a special policeman for Earp, this time in Arizona. After a gunfight at the OK Corral, Virgil Earp 
and his brother Morgan lost their lives due to retaliation. Wyatt and Warren Earp enlisted Doc Holliday and Jack for the Earp Vendetta ride, in which they escorted the Earp family out of town and hunted down outlaws. After a feud between businessmen, Jack reunited with Wyatt Earp again to fight in a threatened Dodge City war that never actually turned violent. Jack returned to Virginia in 1883, where he married Nanny Philnor and had two more children, a son and a daughter. He passed away peacefully in 1911. There is a bit of mystery to Jack's fast-paced life. Some believe he was of very short stature, 5 foot 2 and 125 pounds, but this is not confirmed. The nickname Texas Jack is also a mystery. Jesse James Jesse James is one of America's most famous criminals. Many believe his brutal behavior was motivated by the poor treatment his family received in the Civil War. James was born in Clay County, Missouri in 1847. He was the third child of his parents, Robert and Zerelda Cole James. His family owned a large farm where they used slaves to grow hemp and raise sheep. During the Civil War, the James family was an avid supporter of the Confederacy. In 1863, Union soldiers visited the farm and injured his family. James was later shot in the chest during a guerrilla raid. However, a few months later he recovered and took part in a raid in Centralia, Missouri. The raid led to the killing of 22 unarmed Union soldiers. And just a few hours later, the guerrillas took the lives of over a hundred more soldiers in the Battle of Centralia. James ended up with the credit for taking the life of their Union commander, Major Andrew Johnston. James was shot again towards the end of the Civil War, but was nursed back to health by his cousin, Zerelda Mims, whom he later married. It was after this that Jesse became a full-time outlaw. In 1868, he helped rob a bank in Kentucky. In 1869, him and his group robbed another bank in Missouri, with Jesse shooting the cashier. Ultimately, with a group of other men, James robbed all the way from Iowa to Texas and to Kansas to West Virginia. Nothing was safe. He tormented banks, stagecoaches, fairs and trains. These were mostly successful until 1876, when some of his group were caught during a bank robbery in Minnesota. James fled and lived under an alias. In 1881, Governor Thomas T. Crittenden issued a proclamation for his arrest. A year later, James brought a new man, Robert Ford, into his group. Ford, however, was the governor's accomplice. Crittenden had told Ford he would receive a reward for taking the life of James. Ford succeeded in this venture and after being caught for taking the life of James, was pardoned by the governor. While evading the law, James also gathered as much public attention as possible. He wrote of his innocence to John Edwards, the editor of the Kansas City Times. Edwards wanted to see the Confederates regain their power, so he published many of James's letters. Edwards saw Jesse James as a Robin Hood figure who was fighting against a Unionist government. Many believed he only took from the rich. But James's actions scared civilians. The fear of James's attacks prevented businesses from opening and halted economic growth in Missouri for many years. The lives of these three people are only a small fraction of the excitement of the Wild West. The history of the American frontier is riddled with moments just like these. But what do you make of these three Wild West individuals? Be sure to let us know your thoughts in the comment section below and help us by growing this community while working to solve these unexplained mysteries. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe for more videos.